and we're going to kind of be in a couple different places. You could turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. We'll start off there, sort of. When, uh, well, if you're taking notes, the title of today's message is Commissioned. Commissioned. When I was a kid, somehow I got roped into a spelling bee. Right Now, I, I was not smart, and some things never change. And so I, I, didn't, you know, I did my study, tried to study for the, for the spelling bee, I almost called it a science fair, the, the spelling bee. And they give you like this, this books of just words. And I, if you were like me when you were a young man in school, you didn't like homework, you didn't like studying. So I looked over it, I was like, okay, I'll just give it a go. I probably got close to last place, I don't know. But there was something in me from that time that kind of sparked like, I was very competitive and I didn't like losing. And if it didn't come natural to me, I wasn't going to try very hard. But something struck me after the spelling. And I remember there was a time, I must have been about five, fifth, sixth grade, somewhere around there. And I, I began reading the dictionary. Like, I, I, it's weird, right? Like, what kid does that? Well, you know, a kid that's not very smart might read the dictionary. And that's what I did. I was like, I want to know words. I want to know what these words mean. I want to know how to spell them. And, and it didn't last very long, but it was a season of my, my young life where I began to read through the dictionary and I'd learn words and, and I'd, I kind of became fascinated with words. I like definitions of words. I think definitions of words have value so we can communicate one with another. We're living in a day when definitions of words almost no longer mean anything. They can mean whatever you want them to mean. You just can't tell me what I mean by that word is not what it means. Everybody following so far? Your head's spinning yet, right? So I figured I'd take some liberty today with the word. The word commissioned. Now, we don't find the word commission, the great commission, right? We know the great commission. Anybody? But... Uh, Chapter, verse, anybody, right? Matthew chapter 28, at least, there's, a good, there's your good go-to. Matthew 28, we know the Great Commission. Jesus commissions his disciples. But in that section of Scripture, it doesn't say that they were commissioned. He tells them, go, baptize, teach, make disciples. These are the things he tells them. And we call it the Great Commission. So I'm going to have fun with the word commission today. Okay, the word commissioned in the sense that we use it biblically, is one who has been given a command, has been given orders to go and do a thing. It's a great description for Matthew chapter 28, exactly what Jesus is telling his disciples. He's like, I'm commanding you, go and go do this thing. Just like God told Joshua, go, take, be strong and of good courage, go, go. It's a command. That's to be commissioned. An officer who, like an NCO, a non-commissioned officer, right? Anybody here been in the military? Yeah, right. Once you get in, (laughs) <laughs> they don't, you know, you're in, you're in to do your time. You are, you are commissioned to be a part of that body of people for a time. And you can't get out until your time's up, until what has been asked of you, the, commit, the commitment you've made has been fulfilled. Now, in, so it's, it's, a great, it's a great application, it's a great word that applies to what Jesus told his disciples to do. Now, I want to use it in a different way, I want, because now we got liberty with words today. Praise the Lord. I want to use it, and I want to break it up into two words. Co-missioned, right? Okay, we're co- you and I, we're co-laborers, and this is absolutely biblical. We are co-laborers in advancing the kingdom of Christ against the gates of hell. That we're, our responsibility is to be locked arm in arm with one another in the unity of the body of Christ, one baptism, one spirit, one Lord, marching forward in truth, preaching the gospel, because that's the advancement of the kingdom. People have tons of different ideas of what the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of heaven. I'm not that smart. I just make it really simple. The the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is you and I, the church body, advancing the gospel forward. That just makes it real simple for me. It's our responsibility. And so we are called to be co-laborers, co-missionaries in the sense, right? Because even the word missionary isn't a biblical term. It's one we use to describe things that people do for the gospel. But it's our responsibility. And now, you know, the, the fear is, the fear for my heart, the fear for hopefully your heart is, you know, sometimes the church gets off track. Sometimes we're like, we're like unimissioned. Right? Or solo mission. 
right? I don't know if you're in the military. I don't, you know, I don't even know if there's a military even do solo missions, right? right? You send one guy out, hey, I want you to go over to Iraq. I got, you know, I, even snipers have a partner. Jesus sends them out two by two. Nobody goes out by themselves. Unfortunately, sometimes in our walk with the Lord, we kind of isolate ourselves, right? We do our own thing. We're not about advancing the kingdom because we sometimes kind of create a kingdom of our own. It can be a very dangerous place, and we've all fallen into the trap to some degree. And we use Western terminology to justify it, right? Well, God, you know, God gives and God takes away. If God didn't want me to have it, I wouldn't have it. And it's like, well, you know, sometimes, man, we just go out and buy it, or we go out and put it on a credit card, right? God doesn't want us to have it, but, man, we'll force his, we'll force his hand. We can do a lot of things on our own and our own strength, and that's where, that's where for the Christian life, that's where we get into some danger in life. And again, right, I'm not preaching at you. I'm, I'm preaching at us because I've fallen into the same trap many times in my life. And so what I want to look at today is just basically two ideas, about the mission that we're on. Because I want to, maybe you today you need to be refocused on the mission. What's my mission in life? What's my purpose in life? It's what the world asks itself. And Christianity is the only group of people, the body of Christ, that has a a true purpose. Everybody else is just living to die, right? I mean, we are living to live eternally. And so may we be, have that kingdom-mindedness that we're on a mission. Don't forget the mission. And so, again, I just want to look at two things. And uh, the first thing I want to look at is I want to look at a a, a warning. And I want to start there in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Now, warnings are good for what reason, right? Mom, dad told you don't touch the stove when it's hot because you might get burned. Nowadays, they might go to prison. I don't know how any of that works anymore. My kids are older. But warnings are good because... They keep us from suffering the consequences of sin and disobedience. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, so this is Moses' retelling of the 40 years in the wilderness. There's tor- the, the children of Israel are towards the end of their waiting, their wandering, right? The, the Kadesh Barnea, uh, Kadesh Barnea uh, time in the wilderness, you know, that word meaning in Hebrew that there's the, 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 the wandering and holy purification, Right? That's, that's the idea. They were wandering in the wilderness. God was purifying himself a people to set apart for a land that he had destined for them. Just like the church. It's the same idea. But that first generation, they failed. And we know the story, right? Israel starts off well to some degree, and then they fall in the end. But here, Moses is just dealing with reminding them reminding them of what God brought them out of and what ultimately their purpose and fulfillment that that God has for them. And so I don't want to read all of chapter 1. Jerry said that I I could go a half hour over if I wanted. So so bear with us. Moses reminding Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And so he, he goes through the whole, the whole section of, of chapter 1, telling them, especially starting in verse 19, we departed from Horeb. We went through that great and terrible, that great and terrible wilderness. We encountered enemies, right? And I'm just going to abbreviate through this whole thing. They came to the, the, the mountains of the Amorites, and the Lord's giving them the land, The Lord's already promised the land. He tells him in verse 21, at the end of that verse, don't don't fear nor be discouraged. And everyone came and said, hey, let us send out, the elders get together, like, hey, let us send out some spies to go check this land out. It makes sense. Moses even says, hey, it sounded good to me. I got no problem with that. So we know the story, right? The 12 go out. The the 12 come back. The 10 give the bad report. Caleb and Joshua, they give the good report. Hey, yeah, it's tough. But we can do it. The Lord's with us. The battle's already, it's already won. We just need to step into what God has. And of course, they're reluctant. And in the rebellion of their heart, in verse 26, they rebel against the command of the Lord to go. They complained in their tents, verse 27. Complain, the Lord hates us. He brought us out to die. We're to the you know, hand of the Amorites and all this. Verse 28. 
the warning, right, or the, the, the real heart of the people. Where can we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to the heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. You know, the Nephilim, those half-breed, half-human, half-sons of God, angelic beings, whatever you, however you want to, heavenly counsel, however you want to define these Genesis 6 rebellious angelic beings that came down and made children with human women. They were half men and half heavenly host. But they're giant, and probably the definition of that word is actually pretty good when you look at the etymology of, of the, 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 the foundation of the word even in Hebrew, the word Nephilim. Um, Are they the fallen ones? Well, yeah, they are, but it's probably better because the description of them, they were always giants. We know who's the famous giant in the Bible, or at least one of them. Who's the one we all learn about in grade school? David and Goliath, right? And then his brothers. And we've got Eog, king of Bashan. We've got the, uh, the, we've got the Zamzumin. We've got the, uh, I can't think of the other ones right now. Anybody else? The Rephaim, yes. The Rephaim, the Zamzumim, the Nephilim, the Anakim, right? The, the plurality of these, these strange creatures. They're barricaded in the land. Right? And that's an interesting thought. God gives, God calls a man, right? So we see, we know these, the three rebellions, right? The rebellion in the garden, the rebellion at the, rebellion at, at the flood, and then we've got the rebellion at Babel. Right, so we got these three rebellions of human and angelic rebellion against the living God. After that last rebellion, God calls a man. He calls a man by the name of Abram and says, I'm going to take you and your wife who can't have children and you're super old, and I'm going to make my own nation. Everybody else's hearts have rebelled. They followed the gods. You're going to follow me. Now, that was, Abraham lived to be about 175 years old, so you got 175 years. Now, I'm not good at math, so somebody's going to have to come up, going to have to do the math as I say it out. We'll put Pastor Jerry up to the task, right? 175 years, Abraham, all right? Let's just put it, let's just leave it there. Then let's say that there's, when Jacob gets into, into, into Egypt, there's another 400 years. So now what are we at, Pastor Jerry? He's the last one to answer, not very quick on his toes. We're at 575 years after God told Abram that I'm going to make a descend a nation from you. I'm going to put you in the land. I'm going to bring a, a people for myself from you. We're at 575 years later. And then there's a 40-year interval after they leave Egypt. We're up to 615. He's got his calculator out. He's super cheating now. Gosh. I knew it. All pastors are alike. So what were we at again? What are we at? 615? Probably about seven. If you really add in Isaac's life, Jacob's life, which I really believe they did dwell in tents. I believe biblically that when you do the math, Abraham lived at the time of Jacob. Like you do the math. They did. Hebrews tells us they dwelled in tents together. They did. They, They lived together for a time. So you add that all up, it's probably 700 years. 700 years from what? From the time that God told, after the last rebellion, God told Abraham that I'm going to make a great nation from you. So all this time, the enemy knows. Satan, Satan knows. There's rebellious Anakim, these, these, half be, uh, these half human beings after the flood. They know. They know the nation's name, they know who the lineage is going to come from. They know what the plan and purpose is. God is going to crush the head of the serpent with the seed of the woman. 700 years later, where are all of the giants? They're all buckled down high and fortified cities in the land of Canaan, in the promised land that God has told them. Israel's coming up there in between um, the Edomites and the Amorites. Uh, Israel's right at the right at um, not the Jordan. What's the one south? Um, oh, it's a wadi. I don't remember the name of it. Yeah, they're at that. Uh, they're at. Uh, I forgot the name of the river. They're at a. They're at a. They're at a river <laughs> in the desert. 
in between the land of the Edomites and the Amorites, they come up and they're sitting on that east side of the Jordan looking over to the land and God says, yeah, sure, go ahead, send some spies out. They come back and they're like, yeah, we can't do it. And, you know, I, I, we, we probably heard a thousand stories about the giants that we face in life, but the reality of it is I kind of want to go a different direction. Uh, I want to look at it from the perspective of if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? There's these crazy scriptures in Romans chapter 11, you know, Romans 9, uh, chapter 9 through 11, just this incredible... Uh, Uh, teaching by Paul about Israel and Israel's ultimate redemption. But he says in chapter 11, he warns the church. He says, if God cast them away, if we don't do what we're called to do, what would prevent them from casting us away? Now, I don't think he's laying down doctrine. I don't think that he's saying, hey, look, you know what? God's going to cast the church away. He can't do that. Israel was never fully cast away anyway, because there was always a number of people who bowed their feet at the, at the, the name of the living God, right? And remember, Elijah is you know, weeping and wailing, oh, man, you know, this chick's chasing me down, wants to kill me, you know, Ahab's wife, that Jezebel, and, and, you know, woe is me. And God's like, man, you know, psh, psh, psh. dude, I got 7,000 people who haven't bowed their knee, right? Don't stop your pity party. All right, get up and do what I've called you to do. And I think, I think for me, sometimes, especially as a pastor, and maybe Pastor Jerry feels the same way, sometimes we're like, Lord, am I the last one? <laughs> am I the only one that loves you, Lord? Right? And there's a lot of pride and pomp in that, that kind of heart that doesn't belong there. And, but the reality of it is for the church in general, right? we can look out on the, on the scenery, and we're no dummies. We're like, man, the church is going through a transformation right now. They got all kinds of weird stuff going on. We, you know, letting this happen, letting that happen. That's not even, that is a direct commandment that we shouldn't do that in the Bible. But man, who's to tell anybody what they can and can't do? And so the church is at a point where, man, it, if we fall and fail under the pressure of the culture, what will be left? And now we know the true church will always stand. Every born-again believer, everybody whose heart is surrendered to Christ and his shed blood on the cross, we know our redemption is not through our works, but is through his grace alone, faith alone, the word of God alone. Those, you and I, we're not going anywhere. We, nobody can take us out of his hand. It's not possible. You're signed, sealed, and delivered for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. It's not possible. But we see something parading itself as the church, and now we can't get caught up in that influence. We need to stand on the word of God, because if we do follow the influence of the culture, we're going to end up in the same exact place that Israel ended up. And where did they end up? Well, oh man, I'm already running low on time. You know, after 400 years of judges, they asked for a king. We want to be like the nations. Give us a king to rule over us. Samuel's like, ain't going to happen. God's like, let it happen. Give them what they want. God warns them, gonna, king's going to enslave your kids. It's going to be bad for you. They're like, we want a king, right? Just like those in Jerusalem, you know, crucify him, crucify him. And at that moment, they, they divorced themselves from God. But God was gracious and said, that's fine. I'll give you a king, but if you, if you serve me and be obedient to me, then I will give you a good king. If you do not serve me and you are not obedient to me, I will give you a king that will put it, you under submission to his will, right? And so, man, the church, right? We, and then the church in, in the West, we, we get our leader. We get the leaders that our culture deserves. So, you know, we've got, I don't care where you stand, Joe Biden, uh, uh, Donald Trump, Nancy Pelosi, Gavin Newsom, whoever you, but I don't even, I, politics, right? It doesn't matter, because if the church does what it's supposed to do, and we are light and salt, and we, go, and we go out with the commission to convert, well, man, look out. Let's see who God will give us then. Maybe Jerry will run for president, and we can all vote for him confidently, right? But God gives us, God gives us what we deserve in the moment, and we need to take heed because as Israel's coming to face this battle, 
They're looking at it from a physical perspective. And my encouragement to you is, right, we're on a mission together. I, my personal conviction is that every believer is an evangelist. Now, there may be some who are called and gifted with a special calling and gifting, but I just don't see anywhere in Scripture where any of us are told, hey, go sit in a pew on Sunday morning, and you just do your best in the community, and you be a light, and, and everybody will want to come to Jesus. Now, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Blessed are the feet that go and preach the gospel of peace. We, we got to talk. We got to share. And that's where, the, that's where the greatest fear is, right? Man, I can, I walked, brother, what was your name again? Oregon hat? Roman, what? Omar. Omar. I talked to Omar. I saw his hat. I can walk right up to him. I'm like, hey, bro, man, or I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm USC all the way. You know, he's an Oregon Duck fan. Like, pagan Oregon, <laughs> right? But I can go up and talk to him about that. It's not, it, it's easy to talk to people about things we're comfortable with. Why isn't it easy for us to talk to people about the Lord? You know, hey, how long have you been walking with Jesus? Pfft, I don't believe in that junk. Oh, really? Why not? Like, why can't we engage people in that conversation? Why is it not the, per, our, the, the purpose of our heart? Now, look, I may be preaching the gospel, and you guys are like, man, don't judge me. I'm out every weekend, every day after work, at work. I preach the gospel. Everybody hates me. They call me preacher at work. They call me this, that. Hey, praise God. Praise God. That's We should be accused of being Christians who all we want to do is talk about Jesus. And we believe he's the answer to all of our problems. All of those negative, you know, idioms in our, in our culture. You know, Jesus is your, you know, is your crutch. You need a crutch. You need your will. Yeah, it's like, man, of course. I'm a cripple. I need Jesus. You know, that that would be our heart. Because when God's putting Israel in the land, what's he telling them to do? The whole purpose of putting Israel in the land is he says, I'm going to put you in this land. You're going to be a light and you're going to draw the nations to me. The law was made, the Torah was made to draw the nations. Everything was different. Lending, um, dietary, uh, sacrificial services, everything was different from every culture around them. Why? Because it was bring the people to me. And what did Israel do? They said, we want their culture here and we'll invite their gods here, but we don't really want them here. <laughs> right? It's like, keep the people out, but let the, the contaminated culture come in. And we, and we, we stand the same, you know, we, we stand on the edge of that same form of defeat in the church if we're like, well, we're here in the land, and I'm not of this world, but I'll take about as much of it as I can until I can't take no more, or the Lord won't let me have no more, whatever the case may be. We need to be careful. Israel looks at this from a physical standpoint. We need to understand it's a spiritual war that we're in. You know, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And I get these verses mixed up, so I probably should just go there. The way just sort nope, nope. Ephesians 6, 12. Yeah, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Those are domain, that's, dom, that's domain terminology. You know, the enemy has domain. Does he have domain in your life? No. All right? Enemy does not have the, you are sacred space. You are the place where God chose to do what? God chose to put himself inside of you. That's amazing. <laughs> this filthy thing, old beat up inside and out thing, God said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. I mean, it's crazy in scripture, right? Because God is in us. Christ is in us. The Holy, it's like the whole Trinity dwells. It's a weird thing. I don't even want to like touch on that the theologically because it's a, it's a weird deal. But we've become the space where God has chosen to dwell and shine. But the enemy has a space. And I would tell you this, right? Be careful. Be careful in, even in the Christian culture where we have this idea. And you know what? Hey, I may be bucking a trend here. I don't know. But I, I, I believe with all of conviction in my heart that the enemy has no space in our mind, right? We have this weird theology that oh, Satan put that thought in my mind. And I, you know, I think these bad thoughts and Satan must be putting them there. And where else would they come from? Well, pff, <laughs> I know where. Your wicked flesh. 
that is still attached to your, the, holy, the holy being that God has made you. The enemy has no power over our mind. There's not one scripture to support that. We can take some out of context and stretch the scriptures and take liberty, but it does, does not work. The enemy has no place in your mind. Your holy space, he can't even go there. He can tempt us. He can put people that he has control and power over in front of us to trip us. But he has no power to come into you. I mean, could you imagine that? Could you imagine if your kid came to you, or you go to your kid one day and you're like, hey, um, why is your room so dirty? Oh, well, Satan's in my mind and his, I, can't, I can't clean up. Satan's telling me filthy, filthy. And right, can you imagine your kid use that excuse? Be like, you know, uh, eat your vegetables. No, Satan doesn't want me to. Mom, he's in my mind telling me right now that I shouldn't eat my vegetables. Are you kidding me? You know. I mean, I've had my children sit at the dinner table and cry until they finish their cold vegetables. Right? It's like, no, we don't put up with that. Well, why, why, do, why, as, why as Christians do we use that as a cop-out? And you know, this is why it's a cop-out. And, and, this is the, and, and this is the encouragement to you is, is to be careful what we justify. Because sometimes we've got sin in our lives that we choose and we say, man, Satan put that thought in my head that led to the action. It's like, no, he didn't. Your flesh did. We need to take responsibility. Right? If we take responsibility for what comes in, look out what kind of product we're going to kick out. Right, we take, we take, in, in, in First Corinthians or uh, Second Corinthians ten verses three through five, right? That, that the wages of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. Right there, we, we don't. Our, our, the warfare we're fighting, it's not carnal; it's spiritual. The wage of our warfare, it's not carnal, but it's mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against God. It's the whole domain language again. Enemy has his domain. You have yours. The battle's not physical; it's spiritual. And then the last thing he says in verse 5, he says, bringing every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ Jesus. He makes us responsible for the obedience to our thoughts. Imagine that. Right? Imagine if that's how we lived our life. It's like, Lord, you know what? Oh, gosh, that thought just came in. I, you, God, you got to kick this out. That's my flesh just rearing up inside of me. Lord, I don't want to I don't want to think that because if I make that a power of my thinking, a pattern of my thinking, it's going to become the pattern of my action. And then we just fall right back into where Israel was. Just kind of these lukewarm, nominal Christians who don't have any purpose in life. We've lost the purpose. The purpose of advancing the kingdom. It's the same thing God called Israel to do. It's the same thing that he's calling us to do. I am in deep danger of going much longer than I thought. Sometimes the enemy has us so focused on our circumstances that we're not conscious of the war. Right? Anybody fall into that trap? My circumstances, my circumstances. We get our eyes off the war. We're in a war. The battle that is as serious as what Israel was looking at going to take the promised land is as serious for us. I saw my wife down here, and this might be some tricky theology, but those same Nephilim that got eradicated through the hand of David, finally, right, they're, they're dead and gone. There's different opinions. I would contend that they are the demons and evil spirits that we see in Jesus' day. Okay, everybody okay? Like, what are demons and evil spirits? Well, they're the Nephilim that fell prior, during the flood, and they're the Nephilim that fell after the flood. They have no dwelling place. They have no eternal place. Their place is not in the heavens, and it is not on the land. They travel, and they're, in, they're interdimensional beings. That's how they have the ability to take on uh, a, a human, come into a human being and dwell, have power, control. So uh, my argument would be that those Nephilim, in that day, that we're sitting there waiting for Israel to come for 700 years, come into the land, we're ready for you. Messiah is not coming here. We will kill every last one of you Israelites. And they went in and killed them, almost all of them. Joshua couldn't finish the job. David comes along years later and kill, wipes them out. They're done. They're out of the land for the most part. Well, they, those have become spiritual entities, interdimensional beings, 
that now possess humanity. Jesus comes on the scene. He's casting demons out everywhere. Well, you didn't see, we didn't see that before Christ came. Not a lot of it. My argument would be that that's the war we're fighting. Right? In America, in Mexico, witchcraft. The whole area where you saw Calvary Chapel Esperanza, witchcraft. And in the West, like our Western American European mentality is like, we don't even, like, Salem witch trials, wasn't that something weird where they killed a bunch of witches? I don't even, Oregon or wherever, I don't even know where Salem is. Right? Back east somewhere, I don't know. I don't even know. I go to Mexico, I'm like, whoa, witchcraft. Like, this is real. Like, this is real power. We've had people come in and Try pray, pray with them. Tell them, hey, you're going to pray. Pray, ask the Lord for forgiveness right now. You, you, you want salvation. You want to come to know the Lord. You pray right now. They start gagging. What? What's wrong with you? He's like, I, he starts going, I don't know. I, this always happens. Whenever I try to draw close to God, I just gag and gag. And it's like, well, what have you been doing? It's like, well, smoking weed, reading the satanic Bible, grew up in witchcraft, whatever it is. Those same spirits that that... Jesus was casting out and David turned into spirits and the children of Israel did. I would say that's the battle we're fighting. That's the battle that Paul's talking about. Paul's saying, look, our, the weapons are, it's not, we're not in a carnal battle, man. We can't beat the flesh. We can't strengthen the flesh. We can only strengthen it through the word of God, through faith in Christ, through being sharpened through battles. And the battle we're fighting, it's a spiritual one. It's in heavenly places. It's, inter, it's an interdimensional battle where, the, where these demons and evil spirits have power over humanity. Right? Look at the American government, American pharmaceutical. I mean, I can go on for hours about this stuff. Where, where these entities find their power in high governing positions. The giants, Og, king of Bashan, the giant, the king, he was a giant. They always want the superior power. It's where they have most control. Now, I'm not, here to, I'm not here to scare you because you know what the reality, you know what power they have over you? Nothing. They got nothing. Because we have the blood of Christ. They can't make an accusation against us that will stand because you're forgiven. They have no power to possess because we are already possessed by the Lord. His spirit dwells inside of us. But you know you got those coworkers. You know, you got those family members. Some of those people that go to church with you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? We got people in our lives that it's like, man, they are so radical about destroying your faith through temptation, through inoculation, through, you know, whatever it may be. They want to come in and they want to rob you. That's the spiritual battle because there are principalities and powers behind people. Right? Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. That there are, they are under, they are, they are chil- we were children of wrath by nature, but they still, present tense, are children of wrath by nature. That's who we were. We came out of it by the grace of God. Now it's what? It's our job to bring them out. Right? We don't go in slicing and dicing and killing people. Why? Because that's not the battle. The only time God tells people, go kill, and do a biblical survey of this, when God says, go kill, there are always people who are tainted with the blood of, of these Nephilim. Kill them all. Well, man, women, children, why? Because they're poison for humanity. They are not human. They are not redeemable. That's why we don't go killing people today. But we get them with the gospel. Because once the Spirit of God comes inside of them and, and takes out any remnant of evil, they have eternal life. They're, they're, they become the church, the called out ones. And it looks like we're only going to get to that point today. But I want to finish with my second point real brief, right? So the warning, be careful, church, where are we at? Are we the ones that are going forward? Are we advancing the kingdom? Do we know the war that we're in? Are we praying in that spiritual place? Are we praying against the spiritual powers? Are we the ones that are taking the gospel into the darkness of every workplace, every family festival, every encounter that we have the opportunity and or take the opportunity? Are we those people? It's where Israel failed. Let us not fail there. It is our responsibility. The, and, and the last thing is just is, is winning, right? So we got the warning and we got the winning. And we love winning, right? And 
I got a horrible title for a book. It's, uh, you know, I will never write this book. It sounds so philosophical and humanistic, which is, um, you know, two ways to become a winning Christian. Right? You're like, you're like, whoa, tell, I want to, I'll buy that book, right? No, Joel Osteen's selling that stuff probably somewhere in the future, so, you know, I, he, he can have the money. But, you know, it seems like a, it's a silly thing, but in Philippians chapter 4, and I'm just going to have to kind of abbreviate this. In Philippians chapter 4, there's two things that, that Paul presents to the church, right? He tells them in, uh, where is that? In verse 8 and 9. He says, hey, all things that are noble, all things that are right, Right? He goes through this whole list of these things. He tells us what? He says, in the New King James, it says meditate on these things. It's actually better translated think on these things, which is a good translation for meditation because meditation is the idea of thinking upon things. Okay, So he says meditate on the things that are good, that are noble, that honor Christ. Again, the mind, right? You see the idea here, the mind. We win by worshiping the Lord with our mind. The word meditate In the Hebrew, it's used, I don't know, like 12, 20 times in the Hebrew. The word meditate in the Hebrew, it is the idea of a cow chewing its cud. Anybody, dairy, lechery, anything like that, right? Well, you know, the cows have three stomachs. They take their food down, they bring it up, they chew it, they get in their, their, it's going through this, it's this idea of coming up and bringing down and chewing and getting the mass, uh, most amount of nourishment as you can. And David says in Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Lord meditate on your word night and day. But that's where the nourishment comes from. And it's an old record at Calvary, right? We're verse by verse. We, we love the word of God. We study the word of God, Lord willing. That's our heart. We know that. But man, meditate on the word of God. That we are, we're just constantly filtering, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5, bringing every thought into captivity. We're filtering our lives, our actions, our thoughts through the word of God. Is that what we do? Those things that are noble and right, kind, loving, all of these things, they stay. The garbage goes. And and then he goes on from there, right? The two ways to be the winning Christian. One is to keep your focus on those things. Number two is about satisfaction. Everybody knows from the 60s that you can't get no satisfaction, right? Rolling Stones, right? So cheesy, right? (laughs) The believer is the only one who can actually find true satisfaction. And it's a strange thing because we, we don't talk about it a lot. But the satisfaction in the life of the believer, it isn't some idea of happiness, right? Ultimate happiness. It's contentment. And that's what Paul says. Paul from jail, he says, I've learned in all things. I've learned to be what? To be content. In every single thing I have learned to be. Nothing moves me independent of all external circumstance, I've learned to be content. I'm satisfied where I'm at. He wasn't looking looking to get out, although I'm sure he would like to. He had plans to go see the Philippian church. They never fell through, but he was content right where he was at. And that's probably, you know, the most important thing for, for the believer you want, to, you want to win this race. Be content with what, what you have. Be content with who you are. Because our identity is in Christ. The very thing that we have, our greatest value and possession, is Christ. If it becomes anything else, we become no better than the children of Israel. And that's the great danger that, that we're in in our day. And I have great hope. I have great hope. I was reading this. Um, I read a lot. I read a lot of things. Uh, I got to think, uh, what was I? Oh, I was, it was a video. I was watching a video. I'll finish here. So uh, I was watching a video on this. Oh, this is going to get confusing. <laughs> I was reading this video on this. Uh, he was supposed to be a Christian. Um, he was talking about, but he's in the field of anthropology. So the study of, of humanity. And he was saying since the Enlightenment era era of the 18th century, the 1700s, where this movement came in of this humanism and and atheism and evolution and where we've displaced God and we've brought in human intellect and now we can all just get along because we've displaced the the God who who puts the burdens on people and we're we're finally free from that bondage. Now we can just 
all get along and have utopia, right? Well, how, how, how good is that gone? It's not going well. So anthropology, after a couple hundred years, what the study of humanity, secular people are coming to the conclusion, they're saying, this doesn't work. They said, we need to get back to religion. Now, this is dangerous because we know there's a religious system coming that we should probably be aware of. They, but but human, humanistic anthropology has come, come to the conclusion that we need religion. That's the word they use. We need religion. Religion is the, is the, the guiding force for societal harmony. We, want, we all want peace. Peace in the Middle East, whatever it may be. Peace on the streets. And secular humanists, we need religion. Now, that's both encouraging and scary at the same time. So I really think, I really think after listening to that, I was really encouraged. I was like, man, you know what? There's hope. Because we've got the truth. People are going to seek truth. They're not seeking the lie. They fall into the lie, but we have the truth. So let's get them the truth, maybe in the last moment that they have. Maybe in the last moment that we have. Let's get them the truth because they're ripe for it. Because there's a common religion that may even be here that is going to deceive. And so may we finish the race in faith. May we finish preaching the gospel. May we finish the commission that the disciples were sent out with. Linked arm in arm, going forth with the gospel. You know, that's my hope for you. That's my hope for myself. That we would be people that would approach people. It's not about living your best life now. It's about living for Jesus. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, where can we go? You have the words of life. We thank you that there's no other name. No other name under heaven by which man can be saved. But through the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to not forget that. Lord, your position in our heart is everything. The place that you take in our mind is everything. Lord, may you be the high and lifted up one in every place. Lord, may we glorify you with our words. May we bring glory to your name. May we praise your name amongst all men while there's still time. Help us to not give up as we just see darkness all around us and discouragement. You sent your son into the middle of that darkness and discouragement to rescue humanity, to bring up a generation that would rock the world with your truth. Lord, help us. We want to be those people. Sometimes we just forget or we don't know how. I pray for you to put a burden on everybody's heart in here, Lord. There's a name, there's a face, there's an individual, there's a group that needs to hear the gospel that they're thinking of or are going to think of. May you give them the courage to be strong and to go in the boldness of your spirit to minister the gospel. Help us to not hold back, Lord. Help us to not be ashamed. It's your gospel has power to save. Help us, Lord, lead us and guide us. Help this body of believers to grow in your grace and in their faith and in communion with one another. We thank you for that we still have a place to come, to have fellowship and friendship, and to glorify you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.